Hello there and welcome to this week's casual valuation. We have Camping World Holdings or CWH. I decided to go for a company that's a bit smaller when it comes to market size. As you can see, the market cap is just over 2 billion and its share price was very volatile over the last five years, starting somewhere at around $40 a share down to between four and five dollars a share and now it's up to 25 in the last couple of years. It didn't outperform the S&P 500, obviously. However, of course, if someone bought at this low of four or five dollars a share, then it's a return access of 500%, especially taking into account that there's also a dividend at the moment at over 9%. So I want to cover all the good parts about the company, also some of the risks that I see, and I hope that you enjoy this video. If you have any questions or comments, well, you can always use the comment section below. As always, we're going to start by looking into the company or what is CWH. In a nutshell, it is a retail company. And when you think about it, of course, it sells products. In this case, it's RVs. It is a company that only sells RVs in the US and it also sells certain products and services related to RVs. And we will get to that in a bit as I do believe that that's an important part of the company and the value that it brings. So we have the new vehicles being the biggest category, contributing to 48% of the revenue, followed by this section other 28. We're going to take a look at that. And then we have the used vehicles with 24%. The gross margin, it's quite comparable for all the vehicles. And then this other bucket is one that has significantly higher margins. And why is that? Well, Certain services that they provide to the clients are actually, as you can see, insurance and financing. They are not a company that is involved in insurance nor financing, but they do connect their customers with certain insurance and companies and banks, and they just collect a fee in between. So in that case, they're just acting as an agent, getting a commission. And in those particular cases, the gross margin is 100% because that's what they record accounting wise. They just record the commission that they get and there is no cost. So in certain cases, they have no cost. They just collect the fee. In other cases, they have membership that the RV owners can purchase. They pay monthly. And at some point when they encounter certain unpleasant events, such as one where roadside assistance is needed, in that case, this service is being outsourced. So again, CWH as a company doesn't perform the service. Um, and the, of course, what they make as money is the difference between the membership that they get every month and what they pay to these third party companies to solve whatever pops out as an issue. That's important because this other segment is, as you can see, quite significant, both in revenue. But if we take a look at the gross profit, of course, then it's, it becomes even more significant. However, for the company to continue getting paid from this last segment, especially from insurance and financing, they need the first two segments. So they need to sell RVs without that part. Of course, there's nothing to insure or finance. Now at the first slide, right, we saw that there is a relatively high dividend yield of 9%, over 9%. And when I see a company with high dividend yield, what I want to understand is, is there a long history of the company paying this kind of dividend? And in the case of this particular company, that's not the case. So the dividend yield is of course calculated based on the most recent dividend payments. So for the last couple of quarters, they have been paying $0.62 per quarter, right? So that's two and a half percent per year. But you'll notice that if we go back only a couple of years, the dividend wasn't as high. So the company hasn't yet proven that it can deliver such high dividends for a long period of time. We are not sure whether this is sustainable or not yet. They have yet to prove that. Um, but they have been paying dividend consistently. So not, in, not stable in terms of the amount that's being paid, but they have been paying it consistently for quite some time. Now let's take a look at how well the company performed over the last five years. Actually, four and a half since the last 12 months is 30 of 30th of June, 2022. The average revenue growth was 12% and it might seem quite impressive considering that we went also through the pandemic through that time, but this is not organic growth. The company had made quite some acquisitions of smaller retail companies and they, that of course contributed to increased sales, 
but that's not something that is sustainable unless they just keep acquiring over time. So organically, the growth wasn't that impressive, but we wouldn't expect that, right? If we have one retail location, we expect kind of similar number of, of RVs being sold every single year, assuming the environment in which they operate remains stable. Now we had the impact of the pandemic and we saw in the share price it plummeted significantly. But if we take a look at the revenue, we don't see that dip. And that's exactly why the share price rebounds right back in, right? Because the financials of the business remained stable, remained constant. They, they didn't dip. Maybe it's also the stimulus checks that had an impact there. So the citizens didn't postpone the purchase of a new RV or, or a used RV. Whatever the reason is, it's quite clear through the financials that this first dip was not really... Um, of course, in hindsight, it, it wasn't rational, but the expectations were that, of course, the number of RVs that are being sold decreases, which again didn't happen. So we don't see the impact of the pandemic there. And again, the gross margin is, in my opinion, quite good for a company in this, in this industry. At the moment, 34, 33, 34% increased over the last five years. It has been enough to cover the other expenses operating, so SGNA, sales general and administrative. So the operating profit of the company did improve over time from around 4 or 5% to now close to 10%. Now we can discuss whether this is sustainable or not, and um, especially in the, in the environment that we're headed in today with higher inflation than normal, high single digit, uh, somewhere around eight nine percent in some countries it's it's more than that but since this is a company that is only in the us only us is relevant what that means is of course if the the individuals who are interested in buying rvs whether whether it's a new one or or used one if the cost of what they normally spend money on increases over time then they have less money to to put aside to save and to actually buy an rv so they might just postpone the purchase of such vehicle. And of course, if that happens, we have lower revenue from, for this particular company and um, lower margins and everything kind of moves into that direction. Is that going to happen? That's something that uh, we still have to see as we are just at the beginning of, of this whole process. Now I want to start it with the assets. I do believe that this is an important part to understand. If you take a look at the cash position, the company has maintained a fairly low cash position throughout this period of time that we're looking at. And I've mentioned in some of the previous videos, when we see a company with a lot of cash there for us for an extended period of time that it just doesn't create value. And if this company had 3 billion in each year, then we would be asking what the hell are they doing with so much cash and why are they, why are they not putting it in use? Here we don't see that. We see a very low amount of cash and it is important if they move into a bit more difficult environment where the number of RVs declines to have more cash if they're incurring losses. What they've done in the last, at least in the last more than 12 months, is they had, they bought a lot of inventory. And this is important because when they make a sale, they're not paying for the inventory, right? If they sell one RV, right? They already have the RV, so they're just converting that to cash. So even if at some point they're they're unprofitable, right? Accounting wise, cash wise, they might not lose money if the, the level of inventory declines over time. So if they sell part of the inventory, they just get get cash. That's it. If they don't sell enough to cover their operating expenses, they are not profitable. But that doesn't mean that they lose money from a, from purely from a cash point of view. Of course, in an ideal world, we would like to have a company that is profitable, that makes money, and that the inventory remains at the level where uh, the business keeps on going. The, because low level of inventory also means that their offering of RVs is also quite low. Now, this is not the case at the moment. And we can see down here the Goodwill has grown every single year. Again, that is because they have been acquired smaller companies by paying um, normally less than 150 million so, to get these um, retail locations. 
So we know that the company is profitable, right? If we go one slide back, you'll notice that the operating income is around six, seven, eight hundred million in the last uh, two, three years. But we know that there is no cash. What else we know is we know that the company pays dividends. But the dividend payment isn't that significant so that um, the, all the cash generated is gone. We know that large part also went into buying RVs so that they are ready to, or they have enough offering for their customers. So what else? Well, they are also buying back some shares. What I dislike, and this is the part that I have to stress out, is that they have a lot of debt. Take a look at the short-term borrowings, a billion. Take a look at the long-term debt, 1.3 billion, all the leases. So they have, this is a company that has a lot of debt. And this is something that unfortunately the management has said that we'll focus on. And is, I'm not sure what focus means as um, it, the debt is here for years, as you can see. There was some payment in 2020, but then again, we have a huge increase. So this is one part that I'm not a big fan of. I do believe that they should reduce the debt that they have as, of course, that's leverage that they can avoid, especially when they had a lot of cash. Instead of paying dividend, it makes more sense for the long run to pay down the debt. I do understand that majority of this debt is relatively um, cheap. So we're looking at debt of uh, 3%, 3.5%, but still it's... Um, it makes the company more risky, especially if they start operating in an environment where the demand for RVs decreases, such as what was expected in COVID, but then we had stimulus checks. Now that's not the case. Um, we have only inflation, which is uh, harming the demand for the RVs. And if you think about the products, they're selling a product that has a useful lifetime of, assuming it's new, 15, 20 years, right? So the customers that they have today they won't be there tomorrow or the next month or the next year. Maybe for this other segment, maybe for the insurance, maybe for the membership, but that's it. So they cannot expect huge cash coming in from the existing customers in the near future. And if, of course, the, new, the expected next year customers, they, they postpone the purchase of the RV, well, then it becomes more difficult. But I don't think that they're in a risk of going bankrupt However, that means that if they cannot pay the, the debt, they have to just borrow to cover it. And that borrowing will be at a higher rate, which is not, not perfect, of course. Now, if we take a look at what the analysts are forecasting, as you can see, it's 0%, even minus percent for the negative 1% for the next uh, 12 months. It might look a bit weird, but... Uh, they are not taking into account any acquisitions and, and that's the right way to do as nobody knows whether uh, the company will be acquiring others or other retail, smaller retail companies or not. And in that case, you're just focused on what's, ex what's existing there at the moment and whether that can grow. But not only that, the margin is expected to decline. So you see 9, 8% in the, in the next uh, period. And this could be, again, um, a combination of increase of of wages, right? Increase of salaries that pushes up the sale general and administrative expenses as the sales are quite flat. Now, there is some data to consider. Uh, I tried to use uh, Google Trends to figure out if there's maybe less search for, for RVs, if, if we see some sort of a, um, a decline there. And we can see that, of course, comparing it to... First of all, we can see that this is a, a business that has certain seasonality in it within a year. Right, we have the summers where the demand is highest or close to the summer. Then we have the winter period when the demand is, is quite low. And over time, we have a spike again around COVID times. And then we have a decline of, of, the, of the search for RVs, but not really a decline comparing to 2018-19. So we can see that actually this demand isn't that bad. It's not that now we have suddenly a lot less demand based on Google Trends. This is not the only indicator. There are a lot of others that we could take a look at, but it, it, at least it's, a, it's one that is relatively simple to use. And sometimes there's a, some indication. The second part is, as you can see, for the global RV market, it is expected to grow at 6.7% in the next um, six years. 
it's not I, there was no data available for for the US so I'm not sure whether that will also translate in the US or not but assuming that um, US follows the same path then we should expect that um, the the market size follows the same trajectory but we could definitely be wrong and especially as you can see this is uh, this is a uh, research done probably in 2020 so it was also before the the, before even the fears of a re of recession started. So here are my assumptions. I know that at the moment there's 7 billion um, in revenue that they have. I'm assuming that they don't grow at all for the next 10 years and even after that. So that is my worst case scenario that the company doesn't grow at all. And also in the next five years, the margin declines again because of everything that's happening in the economy. And then it rebounds to 8%. So not the 10% where they're at today, but 8%. And again, if they perform better, it's not a problem, but I want to keep it a bit more conservative. Because they have high debt, high, a lot of leverage, we saw these huge movements in the share price, and that reflects also in the beta. 2.73, so high cost of equity. And you can see here that 60% of basically the financing is through debt. But the debt is relatively cheap, at least at the moment. So they need to make a decision whether to really decrease that or or to continue going with it. I hope that they'll choose for with the first option, and that brings the weighted average cost of capital a bit down, so eight point five percent. And if they move into the path that they're expected to decrease the debt, then of course that we have also lower beta in the long run, as we have a company that's less risky for that reason. So the weighted average cost of capital, as you can see, I've decreased to seven percent assuming that beta over time decreases a little bit so not to one i don't think it's fair to expect that this is this will be as a company as average when it comes to the risk as any company or, or the average company in the market but a bit less average than it is today if that happens of course we have the revenue not growing at all right zero percent then we have the earnings before interest and tax that's what we had at five percent and then at eight percent as of year six additional reinvestments i know that this might seem weird why it's zero this is additional reinvestment that's needed for a company to grow but in this case there's no growth so the only reinvestment that they need to do is kind of to offset the depreciation amortization that they have at the moment but that is already included in the ebit or the interest before in income before interest and in tax as depreciation and amortization has already um, been there excluded so we are assuming that they're investing as much as a depreciation amortization and there is nothing additional on top of that. So this is how the free cash flow would look like. Again, this is much lower. Also, if you take a look at it, a bit much lower than we're at today. We saw that on the graph, we have six, 700 million in EBIT today, but I'm preparing if there's a, a bit of a worst case uh, in the future. And I'm not sure how long it will last. So I'm just using five years that's my worst case. Uh, and again, I could be significantly wrong in, in that regard as well. So this free cash flow that is being generated in these 10 years, it's worth about 2.2 billion discount to today. And if the company performs like this, then the value in year 10 would be 6.3 billion or discounted to today, 2.9 billion. So if we take those, those two numbers together, so the, those two present values, so the cash over the next 10 years and the value at year 10, the value of the business is 5.1 billion. But that's not where this valuation ends. As you all know, we need to add the cash, which is not much, but we need to subtract a lot of that, 3.3 billion. There's some equity options, so not much. There is not really a lot of share-based compensation in the company, 30, 40 million a year in the, in the last years. And we get to the value of equity being one point, close to 1.8 billion, or per share, close to 22. So. $22 a share, $21.5, $22 a share. It's still a bit below where it's currently trading yet, but I'm using really conservative assumptions. And um, of course, the, the $4 a share at, at COVID was extremely low. Um, but again, the expectations were that, you know, stay maybe at in lockdown for years. And there was a lot, there was a lot of uncertainty. Now, there are a lot of other scenarios that might play out. And I want to point out that there is here, here's how it looks, the, how the value looks based on different scenarios, right? So my assumptions was nothing happens when it comes to the revenue, 0% in the next 10 years. 
But if the margin remains at 10% where it is today, and they don't grow revenue at all, then the value is $33. That's already above where, above today's share price. If they manage to grow a little bit, so let's say 30% in the next 10 years, and depending on the margin, you see that there's a huge, huge change in, in the value from 27 to $72 a share. So the margin, of course, it plays a big role, but we also have the, the variable when it comes to the revenue growth in the future is something that, at, in my case, it was 0% over the next 10 years. But if that's not the case, then you see how, how, increasing, how much it's increased over these couple of scenarios. I mean, the, the best case in this case is $118 a share, which is four times where the share price is today. So the way I look personally at this company is that there's fairly limited downside. And there is a lot of upside depending on the demand for RVs. And this is a company where if you have a lot of knowledge when it comes to RVs, and if you have a good idea on the demand for RVs, then you can use that knowledge to time it well. The reason why, why I mean that is if at some point the, comp the demand for RVs declines, the market will punish the company. But if you have an idea of when this demand actually recovers, you can buy the company earlier than actually when the financials are out and when it's clear that the demand is back. So it is, in my opinion, a very interesting company and we could argue that it's a cyclical one depending on the demand for RVs, especially because they have long, useful lifetime and that they depend on the economic conditions as well. This is not a product that people will choose over food and drinks, right? So this is only a product that's in a, a, much lower on the list uh, than the, the necessary products that are in services that people pay for. So that will be all regarding this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one.